We read before the prayer in Galatians chapter 3, verse number 6, Galatians 3, verse 6, where the Bible says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. I want to begin the first part of this service today. I want us to study Abraham and the covenant. If you were here last Sunday, you know we talked a lot about the covenant, the covenant of God. We continued that this past Wednesday. Now, anytime you're, you miss a service and you want to go back and pull that service, normally the next day they're available on YouTube, so you can go back and pull those messages. But we talked a lot last Sunday and then Wednesday about covenant. And the objective is, is we need to understand how to be covenant people and how to stand on God's covenant and be covenant-minded and I feel like in order to do that, we need to learn from Abraham because Abraham was a man after the flood of Noah that God came to in Genesis chapter 12, and we read this in Genesis 12, Genesis chapter 15, and then the covenant was made in Genesis 17 where God makes this covenant with Abraham, and it became an everlasting, unending covenant that God made with Abraham that was a covenant of blessing. In essence, it was a covenant of blessing that God made with Abraham. And every promise and every blessing that God brought upon his people in the old covenant was because of this Abrahamic covenant that he had made, including the children of Israel, because the children of Israel came from 12 tribes that came from the lineage of Jacob, who was the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham. So God made this everlasting, unending, ongoing covenant with Abraham that verse 8 says here in Galatians 3, not only did it include those under the Old Testament, but that God was preaching to Abraham, foreseeing what he would do in the future through the gospel when he told Abraham in verse 8, in thee shall all nations be blessed. So when God made this covenant with Abraham, he he was saying, Abraham, through you, I'm gonna bless all nations, all ethnic groups, all backgrounds. It doesn't matter your nationality. It doesn't matter your skin color. It doesn't matter where you came from. This covenant is going to be open to all and available to all. And so God does something to bring everybody, no matter what their background, upbringing, uh, no matter what their nationality, no matter what their status is, God does something that puts us all in the same boat, all in the same situation. We see this in verse 22. So drop down, let's look at it. Where the Bible says, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So verse 22 is saying that everybody is the sinner. There is nobody exempt of sin. This is also recorded in Romans 3, verse 23, where the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That may be a verse you use once or twice in your life. When folk were judging you for your sin, you said, hey, don't judge me. All have sinned. While you get ready to do something you had no business doing. That scripture was not written to justify our sin. That scripture is written in Romans 3.23 as a response to verse 22 that says there is no difference that every one of us face the same judgment and we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So God by judging sin in our lives, gave us all the same judgment. No matter our background, no matter our ethnicity, no matter our social status, all have sinned. There's no big sin, no little sin. You know, uh, that does not exist. Sin is sin, and all sin has caused us to come short of the glory of God. But in that, Jesus came, and Jesus didn't come to die for Baptists or Pentecostals or Democrats or Republicans or white people or Hispanic people or Italian people or Asian people. No, Jesus came to die for sinners. And so despite what I look like naturally, I know in my soul I have sinned. I know in my spirit that I have committed sin against God and I have felt the guilt and the condemnation and and know that without Christ there would be a penalty that I would one day face 
Now, you might say, well, I don't believe in all that. Help yourself. I wasn't ready to die and find out I was wrong. You understand? So I accepted Christ as my Savior, believing that a righteous God said, you know what? Sin must be judged. But I, at the same time, not only am I righteous and just, God, but I'm also merciful. So God had to resolve the dilemma of being righteous and at the same time being loving and merciful. And so the righteous side of God said, sin must be judged. But the loving side of God says, but I love man and I want to have a relationship with him and I want to forgive him. But the penalty that I put on sin, which is death, must be paid. And that's why the Bible, when it speaks of Jesus, says that on that cross, righteousness and mercy kissed each other. Both of those sides of God were satisfied. Why? Because Jesus, who knew no sin, Jesus, who never sinned, unlike what, whatever his name was on CNN saying that Jesus is a sinner. No, Jesus was not a sinner, and Jesus never committed any sin. And as a sinless son of God, he took my sin, he took your sin, and he he died for our sin on a cross so that the judgment of God could be satisfied and the mercy of God be satisfied. And now the riches of his grace is this, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And my salvation is not because I'm Baptist, Methodist, Jehovah Witness, Church of God, Church of Christ, Church of God in Christ, Pentecostal, Independent, Missionary. It doesn't matter what my tradition is. It doesn't matter what my denomination is. I'm not saved because I'm six foot. I'm not be saved because I'm five foot. I'm not be saved because I got blonde hair, red hair, brunette hair, white skin, dark skin, tan skin, red skin, Italian, Asian. No, I'm a sinner. I'm a white sinner. And my sin had me separated from God. But God, who loved me, died for my sin that me, a sinner, could call on Jesus and be saved. And that salvation have nothing to do with who my mama was or who my daddy was was, or what nation I was born in, or how much money I got in the bank. I could live in a gated community and still never get past the pearly gate were it not for Jesus Christ who died for my sins. Hallelujah. This needs to be preached in a world that has us divided by so many standards. I expect those outside the church, outside the kingdom, to be filled with division and to be filled with hate. But what I am fed up with is those that name Jesus that are still divided. Don't you know without Jesus, we all have no salvation, and it is only through Jesus that we are saved? Jesus is the common denominator that has brought me into salvation, and Jesus is the only way that I have life, and it is through Jesus that I have entered into God's blessing and God's blessed, hallelujah. Not only have I been saved from the penalty of death, but Jesus has brought his blessing on my life, which means if I died today and found out there was no heaven, and, and that there, there was no eternal life. I haven't lost anything. Why? Because every good gift in my life he gave me. I know the track I was on. I know the road I was on. I know the way I thought. And I likely know what I would have become. But at the age of 17, right out of high school, Jesus saved my life. And he changed my life. And anything that might be acceptable in my life comes from a conviction of who he is. His word changed my life. His love changed my life. This truth has changed my life. And if I died to day I didn't lose anything because everything worth having in my life he gave me hallelujah but I don't believe it's a lie and I believe when I die I'll see him and I believe everything that this book tells me hallelujah y'all done fired me up again so let me go back to this verse verse 22 the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Hallelujah. So drop down with me to verse number 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek in the kingdom. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female in the kingdom. The point he's making is, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Read that out loud. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Years ago, I was walking through this foyer. 
Matter of fact, this church was under construction. This building was under construction. The building's not a church. We are the church. This building was under construction. And, and I was walking through the foyer with a man that was trying to get our business. And he said, isn't this something? He said, so you telling me that you got white members and black members and everybody in here worships as one? I said, yes, sir. He said, what, what, how does that happen? He said, I've never seen that. I've never heard that. He said, you, you telling me you got as many white, black, everybody? I said, yeah, everybody got He said, how do you do that? And I said, well, what unites us is greater than what divides us. I said, there's a common denominator that every one of us have, that we're all sinners and all needed to be saved. And Jesus came into this world to save us. I told him these words. I said, Jesus is the common denominator. Jesus is the common denominator. Jesus is what unifies us. Unifies us in worship. Unifies us in faith. Unifies us in fellowship. Jesus brings us all together. He's the common denominator. Who saved you? Jesus. Who saved me? Jesus. Jesus is the common denominator. Revelation chapter 5 teaches that Jesus unifies all nations, all tongues, all backgrounds that in heaven will all come together as one singing to the Lamb the song of the redeemed because he is the way into that covenant. Not your skin color, not your background, not your social status. None of those things matter in the kingdom. I got to say this, church, and the reason I got to say it is because outside these walls and sadly people that have been inside these walls have let the spirit of division enter in and we're getting divided just like the enemy wants us to be because divided we fall, Matthew chapter 12. And y'all got to know that no matter what the enemy is using to divide the body of Christ, I expect the world to be divided, but whatever the enemy would use to divide the body of Christ, he, he, he going to use whatever it is. If it wasn't skin color, it would be hair color. What color is her hair? Red. Mm -mm. Stay away from reds. What color is her hair? Blonde. Oh, I'm a brunette. It'd be, it, if it wasn't one thing, it'd be another. Do you know there are kinfolk that are divided, born of the same mom and daddy? Be honest with yourself. Some of y'all don't like going to family reunions because you and you ain't in agreement. Tell the truth and shame the devil in the house right here today. You know good well. Some of you rig, rig, don't want to go to no family reunion. You know how many fights break out at a family reunion? Born of the same blood, all divided. We don't need just this to be divided. What, the enemy use whatever he can to divide us. But today we got to understand that this covenant that God has made available to us is a covenant that comes through Christ. And, and it doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what your social status is. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. Do you realize, I'm going to get back to this word here in a minute, but do you realize that when Jesus came into this earth, the first people that found out he was here were shepherds? Shepherds were a detested people. They were a cast out people. They were rejected. They smelled bad. They lived out there in the wild and, and no one wanted them near them. And so God said, you know what? Shepherds are the one that are looked upon and sneered upon and detested. So I'll let them be the first ones know that I am here. And so the angels appeared to the shepherds and the shepherds showed up at the birth of Jesus. But God said, you know what? I didn't just come to save the poor. I didn't just come to save the cast out. I didn't just come to save those that were rejected from the culture. I came to save not only the poorest of the poor, but the riches of the rich. So what does he do? He brings a star to light to the kings in the east and kings from the east traveled all the way to, to, to see Jesus and they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so at the same birth, you had the poorest of the poor and the riches of the rich. Why? Because Jesus came to save anybody and everybody. And with God, there is no respecter of persons. Can somebody say amen? Hallelujah. That is the beauty of Jesus. These folk burning Bibles and tearing down crosses and calling Jesus a racist don't know Jesus. They don't know that it ain't a white Jesus and he ain't a black Jesus. The Bible teaches that he was a Jew. But 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 says, though we have known him, we know him as in this earth as a Jew, we no longer know him after the flesh. It doesn't matter that he was born of a virgin Jewish girl. It doesn't matter that he was raised by a Jewish father. The Bible teaches that above that he was the son of the living God, that he was the son of the living God, and that we are to know him as the son of God. It doesn't matter what his ethnicity was. He wasn't white. He wasn't black. He was a Jew. He was closer to being dark than he was bright, but that doesn't have any bearing on my salvation. 
I hear three of y'all clapping. Amen. Praise him. Don't praise me. Praise him. I ain't preaching for a hand clap. I'm preaching to bring him glory. Y'all fire me. Let me get back to the word. Get back to the word. Get back to the word. The Bible says, if you be Christ, read with me in verse 29. If you be Christ, you're Abraham's seed. You're Abraham's seed. If today you know Jesus, will you say it out loud? I'm Abraham's seed. I'm Abraham's seed. If you're Abraham's seed, that means you're an heir. That means you've inherited a covenant, that you are in covenant with an almighty God. That means he's made you promise. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 says all, all of the promises of God, all of the promises of God in Jesus are yes and amen. It doesn't matter what I read in this word if it's a promise. He says, in Jesus, I say yes to that. As Pastor Aaron sung this morning, all his promises are yes and amen. Now, let me show you an example of what we're talking about today. I'm fired up. I ain't mad at nobody. Now. I want you I'm to I'm mad as the devil. But go back with me to the Old Testament, 1 Samuel 18. Man, I just get worked up, y'all. I get worked up over what the enemy is doing. I expect the enemy to run his con on the world. I expect the lost that don't know the word and have the spirit to be deceived. But it's time for born again believers to lift themselves up and to recognize that who we have been made to be and what unifies us is greater than what divides us. I'm not worried about the world being divided. It's always been divided. The body of Christ has got to come together in these last days like never before. It's time to preach the gospel because only the gospel can save man from this life and eternal life. And if we're getting all caught up by the world's narrative, then we get divided and we miss through distraction what God has called us to do in this earth. Hallelujah. First Samuel chapter 18. When you get there, say amen. I'm getting ready at some point. I've got it prepared to do a series on the difference between rightness, self-righteousness, and the righteousness of God. There are a lot of self-righteous people in the church. Mm -hmm. We think we're self-righteous because of the clothes we wear or the scriptures we can quote or how long we've been faithful, our tithes, our offerings, our titles. But none of those things make us righteous. The only righteousness that is available is the righteousness of faith the righteousness that Abraham had when God came to him made a, and made a promise. And Abraham said, I believe you. I believe you. And God said, you believe me? He said, I believe you. And God said, I call you righteous because you've accepted what I've said by faith. Abraham was not made righteous by the law or even the Ten Commandments because they weren't even written yet. That wouldn't come into being to some 400 plus years later. Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. He was saved by faith. And Galatians 3.8 says that what God did with Abraham was actually foreseeing what he would do in the future through the gospel with the heathen. Those without any merit, without having deserved anything, would believe that the sinless one died for me a sinner and say, God, I believe you. I believe you. I believe you did come to this earth. I believe you did offer your son. I do believe he was born of a virgin. I do believe he was the son of God. I do believe he died on a cross. I do believe he hung there for six hours. I do believe he was in the grave for three days and three nights. I do believe you raised him from the dead. And thou, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10, 9, verse 13. For whosoever, whosoever, doesn't matter. Your class, doesn't matter. Your social status, doesn't matter. How many followers you got on Instagram or how many likes you get on Facebook. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hallelujah. That's faith. And God calls it righteous. <clears throat> First Samuel 18. Now let me wrap all this hollering and preaching and sweating and spitting up with one, with one thing here. I want to show you an example in the word of a man by the name of Mephibosheth who was stuck in Lodabar and had no way out because not only was he in a very dry place, he was handicapped. 
He was handicapped. He had been injured as a baby by his nurse who was running during a war and she stumbled and failed and dropped him. And he was paralyzed. He, he, could, he didn't have use of his legs. And he's in this place called Lodabar, which means parched pasture. He's in a dry place. I want to wrap up this series, Dry Places. It's talking about a man who was stuck in a dry place and had no way out, didn't have the strength to walk out, didn't have the legs to walk out even if he wanted to. He's in a dry, broken, destitute, wilderness place. But because David couldn't forget a covenant that he made with Mephibosheth's daddy, he found his way out. This story that I'm getting ready to read to you has three main characters. If you're taking notes, write them down in rows. Three main characters, David, Jonathan, and Mephibosheth. If you don't know how to spell, spell Mephibosheth, we're going to turn to 2 Samuel 9. You'll see it. Just put uh, uh, M, all right? Mephibosheth. In this story, David represents God. Jonathan represents Jesus. And Mephibosheth represents you and me. Mephibosheth, stuck in Lodabar, lame on his feet. I can't get out of this situation lest somebody get me out. Have you ever been in a situation in your life where you knew you couldn't get yourself out? You had gotten so low, the only place you could look was up. And you knew if God didn't do it, then there was no other way. I've been there. I've lived that. And I've seen God show up and be faithful. I want to show you this example in the Word here. Verse number three. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant. Made a covenant. They didn't get married. I've had folk twist this all up and crazy. Jonathan and David made a covenant. They, made, they, they entered into a covenant which was common and still is common in many cultures. Covenants are based on strengths and weaknesses. They made a covenant, a friendship, because he loved him as his own soul. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David, his garments, even his sword, to his bow. And his girdle. David was living in Saul's house, the palace, because Saul was king and Jonathan was the son of the king. David was a shepherd boy. He never knew nice things, never had nice clothes. He moves into the kingdom. He enters the kingdom through this friendship and he's blessed. He's blessed to wear the uh, clothing of a, of a king's son. Now, God had already promised that through David, uh, uh, that David would one day be king. But they enter into this covenant. It was a covenant that not only they made between themselves, but they also made for their families, for their children. In other words, David would remember Jonathan's wife and Jonathan's children, and David, if the other way around, would remember David's wife and his children. They made a pact, a friendship. Now, I want to show you what happens over the course of time by going to 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9 and in between 1 Samuel 18 and 2 Samuel chapter 9, Jonathan is going to die. He's going to be killed in a war. His David Saul is also going to be going to die. His son Mephibosheth is going to be injured to the point that he had no use of his legs. David will become king. And so now David is king. 2 Samuel chapter 9 verse 1. And David said, is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, don't read it too fast because I want you to see it. He says, is there anybody still alive that's of the lineage of Saul? If so, I'm going to show that individual kindness, not because of who they are, not because of what they've done. It will be for Jonathan's sake. Can everybody see that? Remember what I told you. In this story, David represents God. In this story, Mephibosheth represents you and me. And in this story, Jonathan represents Jesus. So let me put it with the uh, translation. God is saying, I'm going to show you kindness for Jesus' sake. I'm going to bless you and save you for Jesus' sake. Hallelujah. See, covenants are based on strengths, uh, strengths and weaknesses. That's why you have a covenant. You wouldn't need a covenant if one didn't have a strength that the other didn't have. Marriages are covenants. 
you don't need to marry somebody just like you. Because you don't, it just amplifies what's already there. I need somebody that can compliment me. My wife tells me in our relationship that I'm the gas and that she's the break. Now, that might not sound popular. You're like, man, I'm all about the gas. That's a man. That's why sports cars are marketed by how fast they can get to 60. Zero to 60 in 3.2 seconds. All right? And so that's the way a man thinks. My wife don't think like that. You could better sell her an automobile by how fast you can get from 60 to zero because that's safety. If I need to stop, how quick will this vehicle stop? I remember years ago, we were buying our first family vehicle. we kids. We were multiplying, man. We had one child. Then boom, boom, boom. It would do a boom, boom. We had three, like, all of a sudden overnight, boom. And we, were getting a, we had to get a better vehicle. And my wife's studying it, and we were down to two. And she said, baby, I just did some studies in the safety test. This vehicle stopped 40 feet on wet pavement quicker than this one. I said, sold. She said, that's what I'm saying. See, my wife was looking at how fast can the thing stop? That's important to keep you from having a wreck. But me, I got to go. <laughs> Without a gas pedal, you'd never go nowhere. Without a brake, you couldn't safely get there. Mmm, covenant. See, covenant is based on strengths and weaknesses. And not everybody has the same strength, and not everybody has the same weaknesses. That's why you have a covenant. And so Jesus came into this earth and his strength is to save me from my weakness. What is his strength? Well, for starters, he was sinless. That definitely has not been my strength, glory to God. And what does the word say? The word says in Romans chapter 5, verse 6, in due time, Christ, Christ died for the ungodly. As a matter of fact, this is the complete verse. It says, for when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. So Romans 5, 6 is saying, I was weak. I had no strength. So Jesus came to die for my ungodliness. He added strength where I was weak. Hallelujah. God, who is demonstrating himself through David, says, is there anybody born in the lineage, in the lineage of Jonathan, Saul, that I can show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. My testimony to you is the love of God in my life, the kindness of God in my life has been for Jesus' sake. That's why when I pray, I ain't praying in James McMinnis' name. Come on, somebody. When you pray, church, help me. Whose name do you pray in? Why? Because you know with his name, that prayer has hope for getting answered. Can you say amen? Can we bring Jesus' glory in the house? I know that through Jesus now, my prayers are answered. I know that when something happens in my life that shouldn't have happened in my life, and I know Jesus did it, I give him the glory. So I'm saying this was for Jesus' sake that this thing happened in my life. Watch this. He said, is there anybody that I can show kindness for Jesus' sake? Church, we're going to always make Word of God ministries about Jesus, never about anything else. This message will bring Jesus glory, and I know it can change your life if you can just see what God is saying here in the Scriptures today. So there was this man who was a servant, a lifelong servant of, of Zybe that was called in, and so uh, David asked him. He said, hey, is there anybody? And verse 4 says, um, or verse 3 tells us, Zabe said, yeah, Jonathan hath yet a son. I'm in the latter part of verse 3. He said, yeah, Jonathan had a son, which is lame on his feet. So, yeah, he had a son, but he's crippled. He can't walk. The king said unto him, where is he? See, he didn't say, oh, well, too bad. No, he, he's not, 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 not concerned about what Mephibosheth can offer him. He didn't say, oh, disqualified. You say he's lame. Oh, I'm not worried about saving him. See, so many times the enemy tries to tell us that we earn our salvation and that God saves good people. No, no, God saves anybody. Hallelujah. He didn't save me because I was good. Romans 3.10 says there's none good. Not one. Not one. Hallelujah. I'm not saved by my own righteousness. I'm saved by faith. I'm saved because of what Jesus did for me. And so this is a picture of salvation when he says, yeah, king, he had a son. He's lame on his feet. And David immediately said, well, where is he? 
Where is he? Let, let, let me go get him. Verse four, where is he? And Zabe said unto the king, behold, he's in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, in Lodibar. Lodabar. Lodabar is translated parched pasture. You might as well say it's a dry place, a dry place. We've been talking for a long time about dry places. You can't get any drier than Lodabar. Lodabar means parched pasture. It's when the land is so void of moisture that it begins to crack open. The ground is cracking open like a wilderness. There's no moisture to hold it together. He said he's in Lodabar. He's in a dry place. He's in a dry place. Say that out loud. He's in a dry place. And guess what? He's crippled in a dry place. That means he's in a place he can't get out of. Have you ever been in a place you couldn't get out of? Have you ever been in a place and said, I'll never get out of this? God specializes in getting folk out of places they could not get out of on their own. And so the, the king says to, 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 to Zibane, where is he? He said, he's in Lodabar. He said, let's go get him. We'll go to verse number six. Now, when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. David said, Mephibosheth. So David, David, David said, I, I know who you are, Mephibosheth. And God knows who we are. Because before you ever called on the Lord, he called on you. Mm, amen. I felt him tug my heart the day I got saved. I knew that was the Holy Spirit talking to me. You can ignore him. Sometimes, you know, we run. That's when we get up and leave the church because we, we, we sense something going on in our heart. And we say, Ooh, what's that? That's the Holy Ghost. Some people run from it. Don't run from it. Listen. And so, I, I, thankfully, that day for me, I didn't run. I had run before, but this day I didn't run. He said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. What is it about us that thinks if we offer God's, God's service, he'll somehow get another give us grace? Jesus didn't come into this world to get anything from us, and he don't need anything from us. And he didn't die so that God could have more servants. He died so that God could have children sons and daughters in his kingdom. Verse 7, and David said unto him, fear not, fear not, fear not. See, he knew that whole statement, behold, thy servant was based on fear. So he says, fear not. Man, well, don't be afraid. I didn't come here to, to, to make you a, a, a servant. I didn't come here because I'm shorthanded. I came here, watch verse 7, I will surely show thee kindness. Look at that next part of the statement, for Jonathan thy father's sake. He's saying, you're going to get my love, you're going to get my kindness, not because of who you are, but because of who your daddy is. You're in a covenant. And that's what I'm trying to say to y'all today, is that through Jesus, we entered into a covenant. We entered into a covenant, but if the enemy can program our minds and get us focused on things that have nothing to do with the covenant, then we end up missing out on all that Jesus has for us because we're not giving any weight in our lives to the covenant. God's called us to be covenant-minded. Let me give you some scriptures to, to write down in your notes. We covered these Wednesday. But Psalms 89, 34, God said, My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Psalm 105, verse 8, God says, he hath remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. Psalms 111, verse 5. He hath given meat unto them that fear him. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. Let me uh, read and inject something to help us with Isaiah 54, verse 10. Isaiah 54, verse 10 reads like this. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed. But my covenant or my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord. I'm going to add this. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed. And coronavirus cover the planet. But my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. What Isaiah 54, 10 is saying, that many things may break out on this earth, but my covenant will never fail. That's why no matter what's going on in the world, we've got to always be covenant-minded. Covenant-minded. When my wife and I were pregnant with our firstborn, James Christian, during our first visits with the doctor, they informed us that there was a problem with her cervix and that it could not hold a baby in the womb. 
and that the bigger he got, there was nothing to keep him in the womb and that this baby would not go term. And so if that wasn't enough, they said one of the uh, ultrasounds revealed a speck on his heart. And they said, that is a sign of this, that, and the other. And so we got all these negative reports that there was something wrong with him, that he would not uh, go term, that this baby, in, in essence, would not be born. So we went through the scripture and found all these promises related to childbearing. And my wife made this uh, eight by and a half, a half by 11 sheet of paper with all these promises. And at the top of the paper, she put God's promises for James Christian. And we put it on our mirror. We put it on our, our, our refrigerator. We had it everywhere. So we would constantly see those promises. And we went and saw this specialist at LSU Hospital that ended up becoming a, a, a very dear individual and friend to our lives. And one day we were sitting there, and he was showing us how what was really going on was not in line with what they had said. And he said, you keep doing this. And he looked at me, and he said, and you keep standing in faith. Because there was no doubt that God was working a miracle. And that baby came out in the 95 percentile of, uh, uh, of others born in height and in weight. And if you see him today, you know that boy ain't missing nothing. He's six foot two or three. And I mean, the other day we, we out working in the gym, and he's benching. I'm like, let, let, get back. let me bench that. I, you, I'm still your daddy, boy. And man, I've watched God be glorified in his life, but I know it's because God remembered his word. We are going to be faced naturally, emotionally, financially. We're going to be faced with hard times, dry places that we can't see our way out of. But that's when you got to get in his word and stand on his promise and claim his promise over your life. 2 Corinthians 1 and 20 says, every promise is yes and amen in Christ. That's what covenant-minded men and women of faith do. Give you a couple more verses, and we're gonna wrap this up. Isaiah 59, 21. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed or thy children, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, that's children's children, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. God is saying, I want my covenant words to be on your mouth. I want my covenant words to be on your children's mouth. And I want my covenant words to be on your children's children's mouth. No word will ever be on your mouth that's not already in your heart. Because Jesus said in Matthew 12, it's out of the abundance of the heart that mouth speaks. And no words will ever be in your heart that never made it into your ears. I've got to hear the word in order to meditate on the word. And I've got to meditate on the word if I can ever speak the word. And that's why the enemy wants to challenge us when it comes to hearing the word word. It is amazing to me in this day that we're facing that it's safe to go to Walmart, safe to sit in a restaurant, safe to be in line at the bank, safe to be at the ballpark, safe to be anywhere except we've allowed the enemy to convince us we're not safe coming together. But I want to, you to know those of you that are here that overcame the fear of Corona and you came to church anyway. To God be the glory. Do you, do you realize, I'm going to say this and I'm going to be done, do you realize there will come a day when we're going to be in heaven? Next to David, who said, I killed the lion. I killed the bear. Then I killed the biggest man that ever lived alive, all in the name of the Lord. And we're going to like, say that then, David, say that. Then Daniel's going to step up. And Daniel's going to say, they told me to stop praying or they would throw me in a lion's den. But I wouldn't stop praying. And they put me in a lion's den and I took a cat nap. And if that wasn't enough, they threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in a fiery furnace for not bowing down to the king. And guess what? They came out and didn't even smell like smoke. Then Paul and Silas are going to step forward, and they're going to say, yeah, they threatened to execute us, put us in prison, and was going to kill us the next morning. But we stood in faith and prayed, and God delivered us. And then we're going to step up. I went to church during Corona. I 
Come on, somebody. Don't let fear shake you. Don't let fear put you in bondage. The enemy's trying to use anything and everything he can to silence Christians. And the best way to silence your word is to not let you meditate on the word. And a way to stop you from meditating on the word is to stop you from hearing the word. That's why all over this nation, churches are being attacked. It's okay and acceptable to do anything except go to church. Church, you better rise up. You better recognize there's an enemy that's trying to take advantage of what we are facing. It's time for the body of Christ to recognize who we are and be covenant-minded and not be moved by fear in Jesus' name. So, so, so Mephibosheth, man, he's taken. He's taken by the kindness of David because David said in verse 7, I'm going to show you kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake. When we read this word kindness in the King James, it kind of looks weak like kindness, like open the door for somebody or helping somebody with a heavy object outside in the parking lot of Home Depot. But kindness, uh, when you read it in the King James, is translated from the uh, Hebrew word hasid, love, or in the New Testament, agape love. It's the love of God. It's a love of God that cannot be earned. It's a love of God that has everything to do with the uh, recipient and nothing to do with the giver. It's a love that's not common to this world. Let me, let, me, let me say this and I'm almost done. The reason why this love is not common to the world is because most of us only know a love like philio, where we get the word Philadelphia, which means the, the city of, who knows it, brotherly love. And so philio is a friendship love. It's a partnership love. I love you. You love me. I help you. You help me. We hang out. We're on the same team. Fellowship. It's friendship. That's a love. But it's a give and take. We both receive. Eros love, eros comes with where we get the word erotic. It's a love that's based on pleasure. It's based on how I feel, how I feel. It's why you say I love chocolate cake. Why? Because of the way it makes you feel. It tastes good. I love barbecue chicken. It tastes good. You understand? And sadly, many of us take that into our relationships, and when that woman makes us feel good, you know, we break out into Michael Jackson, the way you make me feel, right? And so we, we call it love when you make me feel good. And if you stop making me feel good, I say, well, I don't love you no more. That's Eros love. God's love for us is not filio. God's love for us is not storgy, which is a parental love. Storgy is a love that says, I'm taking a parental role in your life. You need me, and I love you because you need me, and I like this dependence that you have on me. So this is a need relationship. This is why women get involved with, with men that, 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 that need them as a mama. They become a new mama. I ain't talking to nobody in here because ain't none of y'all on that boat. Or a man who takes on a wife who he, 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 she's like a daughter. Why are y'all so quiet? I told you ain't none of y'all in here. But it's that dependent love. It's that dependent love. And it's still not feet, it's not agape, it's not hostet. The love of God is unlike human love because it's a selfless love. It's a giving love. It's a love that is obsessed with the recipient and doesn't even take into account the giver. That's the love that Jesus had for me when he bore those stripes on his back. That's the love that Jesus had for me when he went to that cross. He could have come off that cross. He could have thought, called on legions of angels to deliver him, but he stayed on that cross. The nails didn't keep him to that cross. It was the love for you and me that kept him on that cross. Hallelujah. That's a selfless love. So what, what David is saying to Mephibosheth is I'm going to show you love that doesn't have anything to do with what you're offering me. That's why it doesn't matter to me that you're lame. It doesn't matter to me that you live in Lodabar. It doesn't matter to me that if I brought you out of Lodabar today, I wouldn't need a U-Haul because you ain't got nothing. God didn't love us because of what we have to offer. God loved me when I didn't have a pot to cook beans in. Didn't even have any beans. Thank God for the Taco Bell 99 cent menu. Lord knows I lived off that thing at mama's house at the time of my life. He said, he said I'm going to surely, surely show you love. I'm going to surely, surely show you kindness. And it's not because of what you give me. It's not because of what you have to offer. It's because of Jonathan. I made a covenant with your father. And this covenant includes you. And church, we got to know today that the goodness of God in our life is not because of what we deserve or what we have done. It's because of Jesus and what he did for us. Hallelujah. 
And he said, you're going to eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, what is thy servant? There he goes again. What is thy servant? That thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am. And so false humility. I was in church one time. This guy stood up and prayed. And he said, Father, he said, oh, God, here we are again. You're good for nothing. Low down servants. And I heard that. I was like, what in the world? Who talks to God like that? Here we are again, you good for nothing servants. Jesus shed his blood for you. Jesus loves you. You're of more value to him than anything else. You're the apple of his eye. He's number the hairs on your head. He loves you. He didn't die for you to make you a servant. He died for you to make you a son, a daughter, a child of the most high God. Then the king called Zibe, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I've given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, bring in the fruits for him, that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Zabe had 15 sons and 20 servants. That's 36 people that were there to minister to Mephibosheth. So notice, as soon as David let Mephibosheth know he was an heir, he looked immediately to the servants and said, hey, treat him like a son of the king. Treat him as if he was born of the kingdom. And do you know your father? Our father did the same for us because the Bible tells us, Jesus said it, that as soon as we confessed him before our father, that the father in turn confessed us before his angels. Why, when I confessed Jesus, would the father confess me before the angels? Because he wants his servants to know who his heirs are. Your angels probably know more about your covenant rights than you do. And we don't do what Hebrews 1, verses 14 through chapter 2, verse 5 teach us. Hebrews 1 and 14 says, As soon as you became an heir of salvation, God gave you ministering spirits, angels, to serve you. And that they respond to the word that comes out of your mouth. That's Psalm 103, verse 20. Psalm 103, 20 says, When I speak the word of God, angels move to bring it to pass. So here's some folk over here. They don't know their covenant. They don't stand in their covenant, speaking to much of doubt and unbelief, and the angels just sitting there. But hear me over here. I'm going to speak the covenant. I'm going to speak the word in faith. And my angel, shoom, shoom, shoom. And your angel, like, shoom, shoom. And they see in my angel, shoom, shoom. <laughs> and one day I'm sleeping, and my angel is guarding over me, you know. And then your angel say to my angel, say, man, uh, my angel say to your angel, man, what you doing standing there? You got dust on your wings. Man, I'm... This guy still ain't got it. He ain't want to say nothing I can move on. Speaking to, speaking to much of doubt and unbelief, I can't do nothing with that. You say, yeah, I got me a garden angel. I got a picture of him on my wall, a little naked baby with wings. Listen, I don't need no naked baby with wings watching over me. I don't want those that hate me looking at me and then see my angel and say, coochie, coochie, coo. No, uh-uh. No, I don't need none of that right there. Mm -mm. My angel is one like Daniel had. When, the, when, the enemy, when, when Daniel saw it, he fell down and worshiped. And the angel had to say, man, get up. I've been sent to serve you. And Daniel like, I can't look on you, man. That's the kind of angel I want. The kind of angel I got, biblically. Amen. Another, another sermon, another day. One day maybe we'll deal with it. But you've been given angels and more than one to keep you in all your ways. That's what Psalm 91 is all about. I shall give my angels charge over you. You don't pray to angels, you speak the word. You pray to God, and God has ordered his angels to respond to his word. That means when you walk out of your house and say, Father, I thank you that your favor is compassing me like a shield, then the angels take rank. Do you know there are more that be for you than be against you? But the problem is, is we're only listening to what's against us. We're never listening to what's for us, and we got more fear of corona than we do faith in God. We got to stand in faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm almost done. Watch this. So he, he takes uh, Mephibosheth to his table. Verse 13, last verse, and I'm done. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. So here he is, no power of his own. He's out of his dry place. He's now at, in the kingdom, sitting at the table at the palace. I was thinking about this, I think about this every time I read it. Do you know how many times in the Bible a man was restored at the table? The prodigal son was restored at the table. Mephibosheth here is restored at the table. And then the 23rd Psalm says, Thou preparest a table for me in the presence of my enemies. They can see me, but they can't touch me. Hallelujah. 
God has called us to be restored at the table of the Father, the, the table of the kingdom. And notice, at this table, we're lame. We're spiritually lame. When I say lame, we're not there of our own power. We're not, we're, we're not there because we are strong and have all these abilities. No, we're there simply because of Jesus. Jesus gets all the praise for being at the table because not only was it because of him that I'm there, it, 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 it's demonstrated in Mephibosheth being lame that the only way he's there is because of the covenant that God made with Jonathan. And he's treated like a king's son, even though he wasn't the son of David, but he's treated like he is because of the covenant. And you and I can be treated and are treated by God as sons of the king, sons of the most high God because of a covenant that the father made with Jesus and we became recipients of. You say, man, what'd you do to deserve it? Man, I was lame. It wasn't me. I was in Lodabar. I was in a place I could have never got out of, but God sent his son to save me. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. That's Jesus. Jesus will get you out of your load of bar. Jesus will get you out of that addiction. Jesus will get you out of that bondage. Jesus will get you out of that habit. Jesus will take that thing that looks impossible, and he will turn it. I'm telling you, I've witnessed it in my own life, and I've been in ministry all my adult life, which has been a little bit, little bit of a minute here, and I'm telling you, he's faithful to his word. Let me pray with you today. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you today for your word. And Lord, I pray right now that no matter what it is that we might be facing in our lives or what our dry place might look like, Lord, by your spirit and word, generate faith in us today that you are a savior, you are a deliverer, you are a way maker. Every head bowed, all eyes closed, just for a minute. What's your dry place? What's your dry place? What's your dry place? What place are you in right now? Emotionally, spiritually, physically, financially? What place are you in that you think, man, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this? There's no dry place like being lost and not knowing Jesus as Savior. If he can get you out of that and he can, he can get you out of anything. Father, I pray today that, Lord, we would receive a conviction today, that we'd walk out of here covenant-minded to not let fear overtake us and place us in bondage. That, Lord, we wouldn't be people that put confidence in ourselves but would put all of our hope and our trust and our faith in you, Jesus. I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I believe that when I was without strength, you sent Jesus to die for me. And that where I am weak, you are strong. That what's impossible with me is possible with you. So today, I rely on your covenant word that you made a covenant with your son that through his death I would have life so I ask forgiveness of my sins I ask that you would cleanse me of all unrighteousness that you would fill me with your spirit that I can walk in your covenant word and you would use me to advance your kingdom and that in my life you would be glorified and I believe today you still save people from Lodabar from the dry and impossible places and I believe by faith that you deliver me not by my own righteousness or my own merit but because of your kindness, your love that you've given me through your son, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen.